Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Inland Empire Coaches Talk. I'm here today with Gary Adcock, the head baseball coach at Cal Baptist. Gary, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. So, Gary, you've been at CBU for 16 seasons. You are a little bit interesting for most of my coaches because you've coached at now the Division One level as a head coach. You've been at the Division Two level in postseason as well as at the NAI level in postseason. So talk to us a little bit about your background and then also the differences you see in the levels as CBU has evolved your program over the years. Well, you shortchanged me a year. I think I've been at CBU for 17 years. I need that for retirement. So, you know, don't short me a year, but um, no, it, it's been, it's been neat. Um, you know, the, when I took the CBU job, I left UCLA. Um, I was the assistant at UCLA and I was the assistant previously at Purdue. So I'd been in the division one environment and it was my first taste of uh, being a head coach. And we were NAI, and I thought the level was great and outstanding. Maybe lacked a little depth from what I'd seen uh, at Division One, And then we got the exciting news that we're going to Division Two, And I think the Division Two was exciting because uh, um, it's, it felt like, uh, you know, those, those initials in CAA, you get a little bit more credit in recruiting. Um, I don't know if the players got necessarily better, Division Two to NAIA. Um, but you felt like everybody maybe was operating under the same rules as the rule book, a little bit more governed by the NCAA. Um, and then Division One obviously uh, was uh, something that I had been in but 17 years ago, so it had been a while. Um, so it was exciting to see. And ultimately, we took a Division Two team into uh, Division One and ended up winning the league. So I think that just says that the, the difference between two and one is not as drastic as people Thanks. And you guys are going to be the third program. You're there? Or you, yeah, you joined the WAC now, and you have Grand Canyon, which was also in the GSAC with you, joining the WAC before you, and now Dixie State, which was in Division Two with you, is now joining the WAC in 2021, correct? Yeah, that's going to, you know, we got to renew the rivalry with Grand Canyon. That was great to see Coach Stankowitz and played him in the past and know his style. and. Uh, we've had some great battles with Coach Fatenhauer at Dixie State, and uh, that's a great place to go. I, I don't mean to be a recruiter for them, but St. George is a great community. Their facility's great, and um, it's an exciting place to play. My family is looking forward to that trip as it's close to Zion, and they can go do some fun things uh, in between games. So, uh, yeah, we're excited to get that rivalry going again, too. Now, I, I've obviously been around CBU for a while and seen the evolution of your field and the gorgeous facility that you guys have. Um, talk to me a little bit about CBU and how they've embraced athletics, unlike some other schools in the area, and how you've been able to evolve the program from what I saw back in 06 when I first started going to Cal Baptist to now more than 15 years later. Yeah, you know, when I took the position at CBU, um, the facility was nice. You know, it had some old Angel Stadium uh, uh, seats in it, uh, concrete done by the players, a locker room built by the players. It had a lot of love and tender care in it and a lot of hard work put into it. And then slowly but surely um, started with uh, Mr. Totman, um, left some money to the university. We were able to uh, build what you see now. And we've just added along the way. I think that's what CBU does is, um, it's never status quo. It's always how can I help you get better, whether that be extending the batting cage or adding air conditioning to the locker room or adding some technology onto the stadium. And, um, you know, there's there's uh, nicer facilities that we play in, but for what we have, I think it's well kept. Um, it's real professional. It's a good fan experience. And I'm sure we have plans to expand and make it better uh, along the way, um, which we'll need to. Um, but uh, it is a place that you go to um, and it gives you energy. It doesn't take energy from you. And a lot of ballparks we play at, um, especially in the D2 NAI days, you, you'd walk in there and it would be kind of uh, actually uh, sucking energy from you instead of giving you energy. Now, you've had a lot of success breeding players for professional baseball. Um, talk to me about the culture and your – mentality when it comes to 
A, recruiting players, and B, getting them draft ready? Yeah, you know, that's, that's part of it, and I think we understand that. We understand that, obviously, uh, the young men are there to get a degree first. It's student, then it's athlete. But we also understand that um, guys who play pro, uh, collegiate baseball, they all aspire to play professionally. And we, that's, that's something that we need to uh, talk about, uh, something we need to try to uh, help them achieve. Um, the reality is of our roster of 35, you're going to have maybe three to five a year that do that. Uh, but everybody has that dream. So we do things like have a scout day, and we're very scout friendly, and we send out information, and um, we construct a swing that's uh, good to win collegiately but also is going to be good professionally um we focus in on projection and doing the right thing for guys because we understand that that's the dream for all of us it was a dream for me it was probably the dream for you and a lot of your listeners so we don't want to just uh shut that dream i want to want them all to dream that they can play professionally now how have you embraced technology i know that your systems that you use are more advanced than just the good old fashioned, put a one down for a fastball, two for a curveball. Um, what technologies have you embraced as a coach with Rap Soto and everything else that's been coming out? We do have Rap Soto. We also have TrackMan. Um, we have uh, utilized those in printing reports. What I tell recruits and people all the time, though, is it doesn't lose the fact that you know we're still trying to be mentally tough competitors. It's kind of like you got to get your associate's degree, then you got to get your graduate degree, then you got to get your doctorate. And a lot of those technology things for our guys, maybe our seniors will get a little bit more of those information than say our freshmen early. Um, but we're trying our best because, uh, you know, that's the way baseball is going, especially at the professional level, um, competitive side of the game. Spin rate. Um, in the short term, you know, we even used loose technology. Uh, we uh, had this year. We were implementing our signs um, with a number system where we had a screen in the dugout that was shooting the number to our pitchers, so he could look at a card on his wrist. So even some generic uh, technology. Those are things we weren't doing ten years ago. Um, any way that we can to to get an edge or uh, on the technology side, we're trying to utilize and use. Now I know from working with the Pac-12, the Big West, Mountain West and others, the WAC seems to be a much faster when it comes to the speed in which they get their signs, the way they play, like the coaching style, you, Reggie Christensen and Stankwitz, which you've already mentioned, are all very like, get on the bump, let's go, come on and move it. Versus it seems like others in with Arizona, UCLA, where you formerly from, seem to prefer a much slower game. Can you talk to me about the different styles there? And I can't, I, this is what I do for a living. I, I can't, I can't, I couldn't do that. <laughs> I'm like, a, if, if the bell rings for a fight, I want to meet you on your side. I don't want to meet you in the middle. I don't want to meet you on mine. And um, I've got some charts and I work off of it, but I'm working a pitch ahead. Um, I know what I want to throw based off of what you pitched, uh, where you threw it. I don't need to reference a chart. For me, I think um, tempo was paramount. Now, having said that, the notorious slowest game was West Coast. So it's just what works for you. So, you know, in his situation, they're a little bit more meticulous. Um, that, for me, does not work for my personality um, that idle time. Uh, we haven't had their level of success uh, I mean, we're just new to this division one thing but we've had our success being a more faster tempo you're never going to leave the dirt get on the mound that 20 second new clock the ncaa has uh, i laugh at that that doesn't affect us um well i don't think we'll ever have that uh enforced in one of our games now talk obviously we're all stuck at home i'm in my office here on a gorgeous tennis court um yeah. Talk to the folks at home about what players can do right now. Because obviously there's a lot of seniors that lost the majority of their high school season. So yeah. what can they do to be prepared or for recruitment? What things would you suggest as a Division One coach? You know, this is going to sound so bland, um, but just do something. <laughs> I mean, it, 
your situations are going to be unique, is what I told our players. Some of you might live on a cul-de-sac that allows you to play catch. Some might live in a, you know, a, a, an apartment complex where you can't. Um, so just do something, whether it's your old mom and dad's old P90X tape from the day, or it's a, a yoga stretch routine. Um, until we know uh, if summer ball is going off and when it's going off and how it's going off, my advice to them had been um, just do something, whether it's arm care, you know, to a chain link fence. Um, there is no wrong answer as long as you can do something. And then also talk to us a little bit because the major league draft was, used to be 40 rounds. They said it, this year it could be as low as five. You have seniors that have get, been given an extra year of eligibility as a spring year. So how does that look for recruiting for you guys comparatively to in years past? Yeah, it, it, you know, it affects both sides. It affects your current roster and it affects your incoming roster. Maybe more so in the SEC or the Pac-12 than in the WAC, you know, with, with uh, some uh, of their incoming recruits potentially being seventh, eighth, ninth rounders. But, you know, in the last few years, if you got drafted, uh, you signed. The major league clubs are doing a great job um, at signing all their – you there? Yep, I'm still here. I lost you. Can you see me? I can't see you. Well, let me go voice till I can figure it out here. But the major league clubs were doing a great job. There you go. At signing all their draft picks. So those, those six rounders, seventh rounders, eighth rounders for us, you know, legally we're not allowed to give names, but we have two or three guys that we think, you know, are in that position. It's, it's really close to be in a fifth round, sixth round situation. So we're just going to uh, await that draft, and I hope, and I, I actually am really, really hopeful that the draft goes off in June, not July. I think the later it goes into July, the more problematic it's going to be for us as college baseball coaches because, um, you know, finding out uh, late July is, is going to be really difficult to, uh, to get that roster solidified, especially for us who are hoping to start school in August. Now, do you – anticipate a much deeper college baseball product this year comparatively to oh yeah past. yeah yeah i mean i can speak to us you know we're we're returning three three everyday starters that would have been gone um we're just one one group but you know it's our leadoff hitter our cleanup hitter and our number one reliever so um right there we're better and i'm sure um that's you know there's not anybody that's not in a similar situation and some might be better um, it's going to be a little bit problematic, I think, for some incoming guys. Um, you know, now um, those guys that they were coming in to replace are still there. So I'm uh, looking forward to a very competitive fall practice and seeing how guys respond uh, to, you know, some unforeseen circumstances, uh, which they have. Now, are you guys recruiting once you know what summer ball is going to look like? since obviously juniors and seniors that you normally would be watching right now, um, you can't go and watch because there's no games going on. Or are you taking tapes from kids? What yeah. words of advice would you give for high school families and coaches that way? Well, you know, we, initially we started, we tried to be really patient and we hoped that it would open back up and we could go out and see guys this spring. And the further it got along and the more we were, were listening and hearing, uh, we ended up signing three guys uh, that we had seen before but we ended up doing a, a lot of calling and a lot of video work. This was last month and making some decisions where we had planned on going back and seeing them, um, but they had come to our, our camp or we had seen them once. Um, so it kind of ramped up and we had to really rely upon the high school coach and the travel coach and um, on what type of players they were. Um, that's good. That's great. And it's going to work out. I think these are great players, but we're really anxiously awaiting getting out there ourselves and, uh, the NCAA has a dead period right now. We're not allowed to go out and do anything, but hopefully when that ban's lifted and uh, in accordance with whatever our, our state and counties do, um, tell us we can do, uh, we're anxious to get back on the road. But in the meantime, uh, videos are great. Emails are great. Um, those things get us uh, kind of a starter list. So when hopefully we're out seeing uh, guys, we'll, we'll be ready to go with some good names. Okay. Um, now, you mentioned your camp. Are you guys planning, hopefully, 
to have another summer camp this year and who's that open to? We are. It's open to everybody. We have our youth camps. We have our uh, elite camps. We have our high school camps. It's on our website, cbulancers.com, and we have those dates there. But like everybody else, my son got a, an invite for a, you know, a tennis camp, and it's, it all says the same thing, you know, if we're allowed to. So we're just trying to be hopeful. Uh, we had some scheduled in May. Obviously, those have been canceled. We had one in June. It's been canceled. But um, we're hoping that those go off in July, and we have even a couple in August um, that we have listed there on our website. So we're hoping that those can go off, uh, keeping our fingers crossed. Um, last question. Talk yep. to us about your culture and your style as a coach. You talked about that you like to always think ahead. Um, yeah. Everyone has that mentality of we have hard-nosed coaches, you have more of the people person coaches. What is your style and what culture do you try to create? And, you know, we're de I like to think that we're a development program. I like to think that, um, you know, we're not going to be able to, to uh, um, maybe uh, pull um, that first rounder, that Garrett Cole of the world that went to UCLA or Trevor Bauer that went to UCLA. But we're going to recruit guys that we want to become as good as that. And the reason they are going to become as good as that is because we can see your potential and we can develop you. So for us, it's, it's big details. It's big organization. It's big on accountability. It's big on hard work. It's big on um, dedication and commitment. Um, we're not a place where you roll balls out and, and we just play. Um, we're, we want practice um, to be a model where it's building your confidence. So when you go in the game, you're just able to react and perform. Um, it's really a model based off of uh, consistent preparation on a daily basis. And um, it's not for everybody because some people don't like to work. And they don't like high expectations. But for those that like to work and have high expectations, I think our program and our culture is one that uh, when you're done playing baseball, lends itself to being a great lawyer, doctor, salesman. Because uh, all those things I talked about, the accountability, the discipline, organization, those things make you a good police officer as well. So that's really kind of our, our selling point. And we do it in a Christian environment at a wonderful university with a great degree. Um, and we think it's been uh, kids are attracted to it. And uh, we've been able to uh, develop some really good young men leaders in our community. Thank you, Gary. Now, if you could leave one word of advice or one phrase for the people at home, what would it be? Find a way to get it done and have no excuses. My players get so sick of me saying that. But it's on our wall in my office. It's in my hallway. It's in uh, over my head. It's in our locker room. Um, it's find a way, get it done, have no excuse. Perfect. I appreciate the time, Gary. Again, this has been Inland Empire Coaches Talk presented by BSN Sports. Thanks, guys. Thanks. See you, buddy. Stay safe. All right.